One, two, three. One, two. Good morning. Welcome to Shueyville United Methodist Church, where we seek to be united by the love of Christ. Maddie is uh, trying to read a certain number of books in the next two months. It's a library challenge, okay? And it's great, but she just read this, this parenting book. Parenting books are the worst. They're the worst because they make you feel terrible. Right? They give you this really important knowledge that you should have, but then you realize that you might be messing your kids up, and you really don't want to do that. Right? So she was starting to read, she read this portion to me yesterday, and I found myself just arguing with it. She'd say something, and I'd say, yeah, sure, that's right if you want this, and I was just kind of being a jerk. I actually really was being a jerk, and, and then she went into the other room because I probably made her mad, and, and I kind of had to reflect Right? Like, why, why was I acting that way? It's because it was challenging me. Because I didn't want to change. Folks, if that... I, so I, you, we double down. We double down to protect ourselves. And I just have to say, if that's the attitude we bring into worship, okay, if we're going to close our hearts and our minds to God and double down on everything that we've done, then we aren't coming into worship with the heart that God wants to mold and use. It's funny to laugh about it, but then when we get in this space, it's our opportunity to take our hearts and to open them up and to reveal them to God and maybe have something shown to us that we need to work on, something that God wants to smooth out and change about us, and that's the beauty of what it means to be in worship. Today's a challenging one, okay? The topic, what, I'm gonna, what we're going to talk about, what we're going to read, is one of these that if you just want to close your mind and double down on everything we've always done, then you won't walk out of here no different than you walked in. But if you're ready and willing to open up and let God smooth some edges and maybe turn some things completely upside down, buckle up. Let's open our hearts right now to worshiping Jesus. I invite you to please stand and join me in saying what we believe. Let's say our Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remain standing and join us in our opening hymn, number 555. may be seated. Let's talk about uh, what it means to be present here, things happening within our church. And the first is uh, we want you to grow by setting deeper roots in this place. So thank you for being present here in worship. The next is growing as a stronger branch within this church. So that's that personal walk with Jesus. And we encourage you to be uh, taking part. We, we have upper rooms if you want a daily devotion that many people do. Um, we have those available. There's a little spinny cart kind of by the library. Um, it's a great devotion. Many of you have done those for years and years, but a great opportunity to take one of those for free and connect with God on a daily basis. So we encourage that. We want to celebrate that we have 16 campers and four counselors from our youth group going to Summer Games University. This is a summer, a summer camp that we have sent kids to for many years. Uh, it's in Grinnell, and uh, they, they will leave tomorrow morning. They, they report tomorrow, but the four who are counselors from our church, I think there's four. There might be a fifth. Um, one of our college students might be there as well, but they, 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 they reported yesterday, so they have some training before the camp actually begins, and we're really proud of them, and so be praying for them this week. Um, for safety and for the chance to connect with God and grow in their relationships with one another and, and Christians from around the state of Iowa. So we're, we're pretty excited for them. Deeper roots, stronger branches, and the last part is bountiful fruit. Okay, that we ought to bear some fruit in this world that shows other people that we love God. Uh, we have some cool things going down in the next week. Okay, we have four people, um, including Russ Husted and, uh, let's see, Russ Ed Dove and um, his daughter, and then Rick Less. They will leave on Saturday for Marquette, Michigan, and they will be gone for a week. And they'll be doing habitat, uh, a Habitat for Humanity build. 
So we're excited for them. They, it's, uh, it's a lot of work to get ready to go, but they're excited. They've been, many of them, um, including Russ, have been doing this trip for a lot of years. So we're, we're excited for them to go again and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Next Sunday, um, you will see me, I don't know, I may come dressed like I'm about to leave for a mission trip. Okay, I may not, I may not have on a suit and tie because right after this, uh, the last service, we will lo- we'll have the vans loaded and we, um, myself and 42 others, will be headed to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin for about five, six days of, of service. We'll be serving in Milwaukee with um, community organizations there, sleeping on church floors and showering in a shower trailer and the whole nine yards, okay? It'll be a blast, um, so please be praying in advance for that. Sometimes the week leading up to big trips like that are just full of, for the adults, just anxiety and unanswered questions, and, uh, and we just, we're just we hopeful for a good, safe trip there. So please be praying. Uh, and then if you get a chance, just something neat going on, go out and check out the Confirmation Garden. Okay, we have a, a, a cool vegetable garden that's right behind the church. So if you go out behind the church, you'll see it has a big black uh, deer fence up, and it's growing really nicely. And the confirmation kids have been working hard in there with Jenny Rodder and Jim Heenick's help, and uh, it looks great. So just stop down by there sometime and check it out because it looks really good. So we're just excited about that. I want to talk about some concerns. Um, Hayden Taylor, one of uh, the youth that have connected, uh, uh, are connected with this church, Hayden had shoulder surgery this last week, so we're praying for Hayden's recovery. Um, Burl Johnson is still in the hospital, uh, so we are praying for him. We don't know exactly. They're working on getting infection taken care of and then some oncology reports, so there's a few different things going on with Burl, but we need to be praying for him. Uh, Annalie Mahachek is out of the hospital back in the Solon Care Center. Um, we'd be praying for her. She, her body is, is healing, and things are doing well there. Um, she just has some confusion, uh, and she's not always, not always um, where she needs to be and, and is, re- is kind of remembering some of the things she needs to remember. So if you do go visit her, um, understand that she, there's some confusion going on, so you may have to, have to navigate through that. But we're continuing to pray for her. Uh, Dick Lang is at home. So he got home, I want to say, Thursday. Um, I could be off a day, give or take there. Uh, there will be a visiting nurse coming in, and um, physical therapy will be coming in. Uh, his immunity is very, very low, okay, due to a lot of the treatment that he's had because of, his, of the cancer. So please uh, be mindful of that, and we'll be figuring out how we can support them as a church as uh, Louise kind of gets this new, this new reality figured out for, for she and Dick. Um, I want to tell you about uh, one of our youth we've been praying for for a long time. So... Peyton Kendall has been uh, away from home for nine months in different treatment and rehab facilities, and uh, she is, uh, it was it, eating disorder clinics and, and, and different things like that, and she is coming home this week. So it's an exciting time for her family, um, kind of an emotional time for those of us who have prayed for her. If you've always wondered why I've had this band on, um, it says faith for Peyton on it, and I haven't taken it off for a really long time. Okay, um, it's really hard for people when they come home and they transition from a residential facility to back into their home life. That can be a really challenging time, um, and challenging time for family to figure out their new way of existing when someone is back home. Um, but it's also exciting. So please be praying for uh, Peyton and the Kendall family. They are uh, they're really they're they're active in in our church family and. And Peyton's really great. So just please join me in praying for her. I know you have joys and concerns. Some I've maybe said and some that I have missed. So I invite you now to lift up your prayers to God this morning. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for a beautiful morning and the chance to be in worship. 
God, for those joining online, I thank you for where they are and their opportunity to be with us in spirit as well. And God, here we are, your servants, and we get really distracted and really caught up in so many things. We ask for your wisdom to be able to discern between the things that are just uh, what-ifs in our mind and the things that, there, that we can actually set our minds to doing something about. Help us to hand those what-ifs and all of those concerns that aren't real over to you, for they are still heavy on our heart and you still care. God, those things that you are putting before us this week, tasks to accomplish, care in which to give to others, give us the energy to do it, the peace in our hearts to do it in a way that shares love and grace. God, we thank you for the peace that exists around us and for where there is unrest. We ask your spirit of peace to descend whether that is in our relationships in our homes in our country and in our world especially in ukraine we ask your spirit of peace to rest upon all gracious god we thank you for our church for the people around us and the opportunities that you put before us especially those 47 who in the next week are going to be heading out to do service Give them safety, give them calm, give them ability to connect with you and shine your light in all the places that we will be. Help us to be brave. Help us in our discomfort to find you as our comfort. And may we all do that this week and always. Gracious God, most of all, we are thankful for Jesus, the one who died our death and rose for our sake and in whom we have endless hope. And now we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to take an offering this morning. Uh, and I invite you uh, to give as you feel led. For God wants us to give from a heart of joy uh, with a good purpose. So if you feel uh, so led to give today, we um, will use these offerings to continue to share God's love and grace with everyone from old to young. Uh, let's take an offering now. Gracious and loving God, we're thankful for the hearts you have given us that long to share love with others. We thank you for the monetary gifts that we have that we can give. We thank you for the talents and the time that we have that we can share. Forgive us for the ways that we have been selfish, for the ways that we have wanted more. And we give to you all that we have, not the last, but the first. 
in order, God, that you might take and multiply and use to bless and share your love with more people. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and we will sing our next hymn together. Hey, Sydney, would you mind turning my microphone up just a tick for me? All right. Yes, thank you. And it's Sydney's birthday. Happy birthday, Sydney. She is back there a lot. Yeah, give us a wave. There we go. Sydney helps so, so much. She helps at the 930 service, at the 8 o'clock service, so we get to embarrass her. That's what we get to do. I'm a, I'm a track and field guy. I love track and field. You all think it's all football all the time, but, but track is great. And the reason I love track is because it seems so simple. Track seems so simple. Just run fast and get to the finish line. But there's so much going on, right? Behind the scenes, during the race, so many things that go into to, uh, track. And I remember being young and watching a race on TV, and all, they were running around. It was, it was a distance race. I don't know if it was a two-mile or what it was. But all of a sudden, somebody just stepped off the track. Like, they were in first. And they just stepped off the track. And I'm sitting here going, why'd they quit? That was going great. And then I, I learned what, what had happened. And if you know anything about track, you know what had happened. There was a, they were a rabbit. They were a, a pace setter. Okay? And their job was to run a certain amount of that race at a certain pace to take the pressure off of the, off of the leaders, to make sure that the race was going at a certain competitive speed. Now, some people don't like rabbits in racing. Okay, there's always a debate about something. But the truth be told, something is setting your pace. Something or someone is setting your pace. So I ask you that question today. What is setting your pace? Uh, you say, I'm not a runner. <laughs> I have no pace. That's okay. You don't have to be. That's not even what I'm talking about. What is setting the pace at which you live life? There are a lot of possibilities as far as answers to that question. One of them that you cannot say is me, you. You cannot say, I am setting my own pace. Okay, that is not a viable answer to the question. Here's why. You're the runner. Everybody has a rabbit. Everybody has something that is setting their pace. If you don't know you have that, then it's the world setting your pace. It's the culture setting your pace. And if you read 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17, okay? 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17 will tell you that it's either the world or God and they're not in agreement on how fast we should be moving. You can't follow both. So who's your rabbit? Who's setting your pace? Is it the culture or is it God? 
because we live in a world of more. I don't have to tell you that. You know it. A world that says more is better, so you have to get more. There's a really great biblical scholar named Walter Brueggemann. Highly recommend Walter Brueggemann. Uh, he has a book called Sabbath as Resistance. Oh, wonderful book, okay? A book that I, I actually read an interview he gave after he wrote this book. And Walter Brueggemann will tell you that right now our culture says, and it does, produce more. Attain more. Consume more. Everything is more. And that creates a society, Brueggemann will say, where people are now viewed as threats, competitors, or rivals. Because if it is you getting more, then other people are getting in the way of you getting those resources. We compete with people for titles, market share, real estate, everything. I read that and I didn't like it. Okay, I was like, I, I don't exist that way. I don't, ex I don't see people as competitors or threats. Brueggemann is wrong. And then I had to ask myself why I can't take a break. Why can't I take a break? I got home on the 5th of July. Okay, on the 3rd, we had church, right? And then we left and we went to Centerville. And I got home. We got home a little earlier than I imagined we would get home on the 5th. It was kind of mid-afternoon, and so we got everything put away, and everything was fine, and the family went out to play, the kids wanted to play with the neighbor, and I found myself, everybody was outside, I found myself in the house, and I was pacing, because all on the table was my work, my laptop, and I knew I had emails, okay, and there was that commentary there that I could read about this sermon, and I was pacing back and forth going, do I do the work, or do I go outside? I told Maddie I would take this day off. I wasn't supposed to be working, but if I just got those emails done, then the next day I would be even in a better place to do something else. I could be productive with this time more. You ever felt that way? The rabbit of this culture was setting my pace, and I even used God as a good excuse. It's not just work. It's not just work where pace is off, okay? It's also in how we parent. Some of you are, are past those years, but once you're a parent, you're always a parent, so you're going to understand this, okay? It's how we parent. And when we parent, we say busy is the best. They got to play more games. They got to go to more practices. They got to go, go, go. <sighs> I drive past these baseball fields on my way here every Sunday. And if I'm a little behind my schedule, okay, and I'm not here like before the sun comes up, then people are already at that field. And there's like seven of them. And when I drive home, they will mock me. <laughs> Those full parking lots will, mark the, will mock the semi-empty parking lot of the church. And it bothers me and it hurts, but what would happen if we said no? Parents, what would happen if we said no? Would our kids fall behind? Would we be left out? Would they be left out of something? Would they be left out? Would our kids grow up and hate us because they missed some scholarship opportunity because we missed a weekend baseball tournament? Would they get in trouble because they were bored? Isn't that what we say? Bored kids get in trouble, so let's keep them really busy. Or is it that we don't know how to slow down either? Serious question. Are we setting their pace according to the culture because our pace is according to the culture and they have to keep up with us? There's a book, that book that Maddie was reading that I wanted her to put away. <laughs> Remember how I started the service? It's written by Hunter Clark Fields. It has nothing to do with church, but it's really insightful about society. And in that book, she says that downtime is crucial for kids. Crucial. If you're a teacher, you know this. That boredom is a gift you can give your kids. Let them be bored. Because boredom is the precursor to creativity. When they're finally bored, they can actually use their mind to think of something new. And what a gift you give them for the rest of their life. That's not even faith. That's not even the faith side of it. You want to go the faith side? Where are we saying that God ranks? By the pace that we set. Now, maybe none of you are thinking this, but maybe you are. They'll start thinking it at the 930 and 1045 service, okay? They're going to say, uh, look at you, Pastor Brody. Your kids are only five. You'll be a hypocrite in a few years. 
<laughs> I, I know, I mean, dads have said that to me when I've talked to them about this before. That's fine. That's okay. I didn't say you couldn't play a weekend tournament. I'm not creating the rules. I'm just pointing to the pace setter. That's it. You aren't setting that pace. The culture is. And the culture doesn't love you or your children. The culture doesn't love you or your children. The culture uses you and me for our money, our time, and our competition so that they can get other people to spend their money and their time. Do you see what is setting our pace? Do you know who does love you? God. And Jesus came to show you that. And I want to tell you some good news. God gives us another pace. God gives us another option other than the pace of the culture. One that is baked right into creation. Remember, we're in the garden in this series, right? We're in Genesis. It's baked right into how God created the world. It's a way to respond to the pace that the culture sets. And it's found in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I want to read it to you. Now remember, here's what's happened. Okay, quick recap. In Genesis 1, God created everything in six days. And everything that God created was good. And there was this rhythm, remember? God said it would happen, it happened. God said it was good, and then there was evening, and there was morning, and then the next day happened. And we continue with that rhythm. Here we go. The heaven and the earth and all who lived in them were completed. On the sixth day, God completed all the work he had done. And on the seventh day, God rested from all the work he had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all the work of creation. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You were created by God. If you read on, you will find that we were created, actually, if you read backwards, back in Genesis 1, that we were created in God's image. And God's image also has a pace. Six days of work, one day of rest. Let's just emphasize for a second that work is not diminished there. It repeats that God got a lot of work done in six days. God worked really hard in six days. God did a lot of really good things in six days. Work is good. But then there's rest. A rest that connects us with the God that made us. And God gave that to us as a gift, not a curse. If you go to Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus chapter 20. I've got it marked. Exodus chapter 20. God is giving the commandments, the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. Now, you remember what happened? Israelites were enslaved. They were worked to the bone seven days a week, many, many hours a day. And then God takes them out of slavery And and they're wandering through the wilderness, and God gives them these commandments, these good commandments to guide them the rest of their life. And here we go. The fourth commandment is this. Remember the Sabbath day, the day of rest, and keep it holy. Six days you may work and do all of your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or the immigrant who is living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh. This is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Forced labor to six days of work and a day of rest. A different pace. But you have to pick your pace setter, church. You see, Jesus offered something different than the breakneck speed of the world. A yes to Jesus, stay with me, is a yes to God's gracious peace. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you hear what Jesus wants for us? A yes to Jesus is a yes to a pace of service and worship. 
Because if you really, if, I hope you play like critical person with me because we know each other and love each other. So if you're being critical person, you're going, yeah, but Jesus also gave the parable of the talents. Remember this one? Right, where he's like, I give you, this landowner gives money to the people and then he goes away and he comes back and he wants to see that they've multiplied it, he wants to see if they've done good work with it. Absolutely, you ought to multiply your talents. You ought to be doing something. You ought to be serving people. Six days, a day of rest with the right pace. What if we took a day to rest and connect with God? Not to ignore our own needs or the needs of others, but to be attentive to them without time constraints. That's what Sabbath is. You can serve someone on the Sabbath, absolutely. But how often do we serve and we're like, I got an hour. <laughs> My neighbor needs something. Can I fit it in in 45 minutes? Imagine if you had a day where you could just see what people needed and you didn't have to look at your watch. That is a really good use of Sabbath. Life-giving. You're not hurrying. You're just present. That's what the mission trip is. Russ knows this. If you've been on a youth mission trip, you know this. You don't have anywhere else to be, so you know what you can fully do? The work ahead of you. Some of you are like, that's retirement. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. So what, what can I do on the Sabbath? That's what some people are going to be saying right now. So what can I do on the Sabbath? Like, you said I can do things that like fill my soul. I really like baseball. <laughs> I like mowing. I actually like dishes and laundry and work is my hobby. Stop. Okay, stop. It's about worship. Worship and rest and being with people, fully present with them and willing to serve because you don't have to do something else. If you really do like to mow, mow your neighbor's yard. But ask them first. The Sabbath day is not a day to get ready for the week ahead. See, if you think that's what it is, you're just trying to be more productive and you're stuck in this productivity mindset. It's a day to rest your body from the week that was for the week ahead, but to also rest your soul and connect with God and serve the people around us. We are not on the Sabbath day, listen, loud and clear, to recreate a system of oppressive rules. That's not what Sabbath was about. A yes to Jesus is not a yes to a new system of oppression. That's why Jesus came and that's what he said about the Sabbath. I'm going to read to you from Mark chapter 2. We're all over the Bible today. Genesis, Exodus, Mark. Listen to this. Here, Jesus addresses Sabbath straight up. End of 2, beginning of 3 in Mark. Jesus went through the wheat fields on the Sabbath. As his disciples made their way, they were picking heads of wheat. The Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the Sabbath law? Picking grain, okay? Because they were hungry. He said to them, Haven't you read what David did when he was in need, when he and those with him were hungry? During the time when Abathar was high priest, David went into God's house, and he ate the bread of the presence, which only the priests were allowed to eat. He also gave bread to those who were with him. Then Jesus said, the Sabbath was created for humans. Humans weren't created for the Sabbath. This is why the human one is Lord even over the Sabbath. You hear the gift that it is? Jesus goes on. The next thing he does is he enters the synagogue and he heals someone. And, and he, says, he says here, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Hmm. And then he does it. You know what the Pharisees say right at the end? The Pharisees got with the supporters of Herod to plan how to destroy Jesus. Jesus was kind and loving, connected with God and served others on the Sabbath. It wasn't about not doing something. It was about what you are doing in service, not for yourself. Hmm. Sabbath is meant to give you life. Not hurried along. 
there may be nothing you're going to do less than observe Sabbath in any tangible way. I just said everything that I just said and made every case that Sabbath is baked into creation and it's God's gift to us and it's something we ought to embrace, right? And I fully realize as I stand before you that the chances are you are going to change nothing about your pace. And guess what? That's just fine. We still love you and you're still welcome and I'm not going to check your schedule. You don't have to prove to me that you're on a Sabbath. But I do want to tell you one thing. From the bottom of my heart, you were not made to run this fast. And I wasn't either. I remember my sophomore year, at, I was in high school and we ran at the Drake Relays. I was the slow guy on the team. Okay, we had Zach Finch and Brad Bond and my brother, and they were faster than me. So that meant I was the second runner in the 4x4, four four. okay? And I was the slow guy, and that meant I was the guy, if you know anything about track, the second runner breaks the stagger and gets to, on the backstretch, gets to fall in, okay? And everybody runs in lane one. All right, so I came around the first turn, and I fall in. Well, Brad Bond had given me the baton in really good position. And I was up at the front. There was a guy ahead of me. And I fell in, a guy right behind me, and then a guy right on my outside. I was completely pinned in, and they were running way too fast for me. <laughs> but I couldn't slow down. Literally could not slow down. If I would have slowed down, the guy in the back would have ran right up my back, and those spikes are sharp. Okay, I couldn't get out because that guy was keeping me pinned in. I ran that 400 faster than I ever had run a 400 in my life. And when I got done, I was trashed. Okay? It hurt so bad. I was running a pace that I was not meant to keep at that point in my life. Church, listen, you are not designed to limp across the finish line of life. Running a pace you couldn't keep. I'm preaching to myself today as much as you. Please understand that. I got to stop saying I'm so busy with a hint of pride. Or no, I'm so busy so no one will ask me to do something else. You never do that, do you? <laughs> no more last day of vacation, cutting it short so I can get caught up on emails. There's a better pace, one that I was created for and you were created for as well. And it involves a no to the culture and a yes to Jesus. I would rather pace myself with the one who died to save me than the world who will run me ragged and toss me aside. Because in the garden, Jesus walks with us and he talks with us, but I can't be running ahead. If you're laying by the finish line of life at the end because you ran the wrong pace, guess who's going to pick you up? Jesus. If you find yourself right now completely tired at the pace you can't keep up, guess who loves you and picks you up and will walk with you? Jesus. Let him set your pace. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for rescuing us because it feels like we're trapped on that track in between people who are trying to run a lot faster than we are. God, help us to be strong enough to say no to that culture and yes to you. And Sabbath is one big marker with which we can do that. Thank you for Jesus, the one who died to save us. And in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song.
Parents, you do this because you love your kids. You do all the things that you do or that you did as parents because you love your kids and you want to teach them and you want to give them opportunity, and that is absolutely great. But you have to ask yourself, and we have to ask ourselves, what are we actually teaching them? In this book that I read, this counselor, this lady says that someone was bringing their kids to counseling. And they would hurry in and squeeze it in between practice and then another practice. And they would eat McDonald's on the way there. And then they would deal with their anxiety while they were in counseling. And then she's like, isn't that the source of the anxiety? 2013, 100,000 college students were polled. Over half of them in 2013, and this hasn't gotten better, over half of them said they were very sad and completely overwhelmed with anxiety. And they were busy. Let's teach them to be attentive to God and to run at God's pace because that is the greatest gift that we can give them. Even better than the scholarship, which they can win in the driveway, okay? They can win it in the driveway. I got this apple tree outside my window. You guys seen the apple tree? We're not treating it very well, okay? Because did you know that fruit trees can overproduce? They get so many apples on them that the branches break. They are so productive that they destroy themselves. And I'm sitting here at 6 o'clock this morning looking out my window at this apple tree, and I'm like, the branches are going to break. It is so productive that it's going to destroy itself. And I said, wow, that's us. We are so stinking productive that we're going to detach ourselves from the vine that is Jesus. Cut back a little. Be healthy. John 15, 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. You remain in me and I in you. You will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. Connect with Jesus, bear fruit, go in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.